Godzilla is a monster of many talents. He's a malevolent force of chaos, a goofy good-natured hero, a destroyer, a protector, and a national treasure. But where did this giant green Goliath come from? How has he stayed relevant for over 60 years? And what does the future have in store for the king of the monsters? I'm Moose, and this is the true story of Godzilla. The Big G's origins can be traced back to 1945, when the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki left a jagged scar in the cultural consciousness of Japan. And as the nation began its miraculous post-war recovery, they coped with the unthinkable tragedy through art. Out of humanity's darkest moment, a king was born. Godzilla wasn't the first kaiju by a long shot. He was directly inspired by giant monsters that preceded him, like King Kong, and especially the, the beast. beast. The Beast. The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. As well as the real life Lucky Dragon incident, where a Japanese fishing ship was irradiated by fallout from a US hydrogen bomb test. Japanese studio Toho developed the movie under the codename Project G for giant, although they didn't know exactly what form their titular terror would take. Early concepts ranged from a massive octopus to a monster with a mushroom cloud for a head, before finally setting on the iconic design inspired by dinosaurs and alligators, as well as a name derived from the Japanese words for gorilla, gorilla, and whale, kudzira. Godzilla was nature's revenge for mankind's meddling with destructive forces they barely understand. He's the embodiment of the pain and sorrow felt by a people who suffered unprecedented devastation. And at the end of the day, he was also a very sweaty man in a suit. Toho originally planned on using stop motion to create the colossal creature, but that would have been prohibitively expensive for it was already turning out to be the costliest Japanese film ever made up to that point. Instead, the crew, led by Aiji Tsuburaya and director Ishiro Honda, designed a 220 pound, six and a half foot tall suit made of bamboo, metal mesh, and dense latex rubber. And since portraying a giant monster with a guy in a suit hadn't really been done before, they didn't put much thought into how Haruo Nakajima, the performer inside the costume, would feel. Under the hot studio lights required by the high-speed cameras, the suit temperature skyrocketed to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, and Nakajima could only spend three minutes at a time inside it before literally passing out. Thankfully, his suffering wasn't for naught. When it released in 1954, Gojira was a modest hit in Japan, enough to earn a sequel the next year, Godzilla Raids Again. But Godzilla made an even bigger splash overseas. Released in 1956 as Godzilla, King of the Monsters, with an exclamation point, the American version made heavy cuts to Honda's original film. They lightened the anti-atomic message, they removed a subplot about arranged marriage, and they shoehorned in scenes starring actor Raymond Burr as an American reporter covering Godzilla's rampage. Terrible sea of fire engulfs all. Despite, or maybe because of the changes, the movie was a surprise hit here, paving the way for decades of silly dubs. Tell you what, join the network. You might learn something. <laughs> and more than a few attempts to Americanize the awesome might of the big G. We'll get to that soon, but meanwhile, back in his home country, Godzilla was undergoing eras of evolution. <laughs> oh, it's Godzilla! Following the first two films, Godzilla would slumber for a few years as Toho introduced new kaiju in their own standalone films, like the soaring scorcher Rodan and the mysterious Mothra. The market for monsters was booming, so in 1962, Toho pitted the two biggest, and I mean biggest, names in kaiju cinema against one another in a no holds barred death match. King Kong vs. Godzilla originally began as King Kong meets Frankenstein, but when that fell through, Toho quickly snapped up the production and inserted their own icon instead. Back then, Kong was the bigger draw and Godzilla was still seen as an evil heel. So, despite the urban legend that two different endings were produced for US and Japanese audiences, in every single version, the ape comes out on top. Ah! 
Kong vs. Godzilla marked a turn for Toho's Terrible Lizard. The movie was a lot more lighthearted and fun than its grim predecessors, which kind of goes against the original Godzilla's somber anti-war message. But hey, the kids loved it, and Toho were off to the races. They released a total of 15 Godzilla movies during the Showa era, named after the Japanese emperor at the time. And while it introduced formidable foes in King Ghidorah and Mechagodzilla, as the series continued, the budget shrank and the stories got sillier. Something's wrong. Correct it. Son of Godzilla introduced Minida, Goji's awful offspring, who just kind of looked like a fossilized turd. And by the time Godzilla vs. Gigan rolled around, the destructive beasts responsible for the horrific deaths of untold thousands are just kind of hanging out on Monster Island, cracking wise and shooting the breeze. The original run ended in 1974, and it took nearly a decade for Toho to return him to his roots with the return of Godzilla in 1984. The Heisei era was a welcome return to the days of a cold, uncaring creature. He still battled monsters that threatened his turf, but this Godzilla was a far cry from the flying, friendly cartoon character he devolved into. The Heisei films also followed a strict continuity. Much like the new Halloween, they ignored every film except the original and told a serialized story about a slightly futuristic society battling a cast of killer kaiju, ending with Godzilla's heroic death at the hands of Destroya. See our How to Kill Godzilla episode for more on that. The Big G wasn't allowed to rest in peace for long, however. He returned from the grave in response to his ultimate defilement, the most infamous of his many American adaptations. Ever since he first stomped ashore, the US has been obsessed with this not so jolly green giant. Godzilla has shilled Dr. Pepper, got dunked on by Charles Barkley, and earned the accolades of his Hollywood peers. Just search Godzilla Charles Barkley. He did a Nike commercial in the 90s. It's actually quite sick. He might be the most beloved Japanese import next to Nintendo, but he's uniquely tied to the country and its culture, which is probably why most attempts to Americanize him miss the mark. By the 70s, American studios were licensing the Big G for various properties like the Marvel comic that pitted him against the Avengers and the Hanna-Barbera animated series. Now for pure nostalgia, you can't beat it, but this watered down, censored show has to answer for the sin of introducing the world to Godzuki, Godzilla's cowardly nephew that's just as annoying as his son, but somehow even less cute. You'd better at least teach Godzuki how to dog paddle. Don't you mean monster paddle? In the 80s, horror movie director Steve Miner shopped around a big budget blockbuster adaptation called Godzilla, King of the Monsters in 3D. But he couldn't find a studio that would pony up the dough. Instead, Toho just released the first Heisei film in the US, renamed Godzilla 1985, and given the good old Raymond Burr treatment. To remind us of how puny we really are in the face of a tornado, an earthquake, or a Godzilla. TriStar Pictures snapped up the rights in 1992 and spent years developing the film with speed director Jan de Bont, who commissioned a faithful redesign from FX legend Stan Winston. Then they threw it out the window, hired the dude who made Independence Day, and came up with this monstrosity. When they pitched this Godzilla in name only design to Toho, the Japanese execs didn't really know how to deal with it. He eventually approved, it was kind of like a, uh-huh, cool, let's do it. But after the film proved to be a box office bust, they did an about face and openly trashed the 98 design. Now the 98 Godzilla isn't a total loss. There are a bunch of Simpsons voice actors in it for some reason. Yeah, all right, very good. 
and the animated series it inspired was actually pretty decent. But the reception was so bad that Toho actually revived their own franchise to save Godzilla's good name, unleashing the Millennium series the following year. Unlike the previous two eras, the Millennium films don't follow a strict continuity. It's more like an anthology series that told a variety of standalone stories about the big guy that range from straightforward stomps to matrixed out kung fu battle royale. <laughs> Two thousand four's Final Wars marked Godzilla's 50th anniversary, and to celebrate, Toho announced that they were putting the big guy to bed for the next 10 years. In the meantime, the success of Marvel Studios sent Hollywood on a mad dash to find the next cinematic universe, and Toho's bestiary was a no-brainer. Much like Universal's bullpen of famous monsters, Toho had already pulled off the shared universe trick in the 60s. Unlike Universal, their shared universe actually got off to a good start, with Gareth Edwards' 2014 Godzilla. It's not a perfect film, but honestly, its biggest flaws, not enough Brian Cranston and too much focus on the human characters, could easily be applied to half of the classic Toho films anyway. And besides, they absolutely nailed the most important part, Godzilla's design. It's a perfect mix of classic vibes crossed with the bulk and ferocity of a grizzly bear. And when he finally unleashed that atomic breath, mwah. Avengers Assemble, eat your heart out. After the American film's success, Toho itself got back in the game with Shin Godzilla, a return to the monster's deeply political roots that transformed him into a towering symbol of the 2011 Fukushima meltdown, as well as three awesome animes set in a far distant apocalyptic future. Meanwhile, in the States, Legendary Pictures is about to enter phase two of its MonsterVerse with King of the Monsters, bringing back the big guy and introducing some old friends like Mothra and Rodan, as well as Godzilla's ultimate enemy, Monster Zero himself, the great King Ghidorah. And after these titans tussle, we've still got the rematch of the century in store, with the big G set to showdown against Skull Island's Colossal Kong. So why has Godzilla succeeded when so many shared universes have fizzled out? Is it his iconic design and decades of history? His status as a symbol of the atomic age? Or are colossal kaiju clashing over cities just a concept that stands the test of time? Either way, it doesn't look like Godzilla's dominance will be derailed anytime soon. Hail to the king, baby. My God, Zilla. Thanks for watching everyone. What is your favorite era of Godzilla? Do you like the goofiness of the Showa stuff? Are you a fan of the serious Heisei era or the variety of the Millennium series? Hey, maybe you're just a fan of the American version. It's pretty cool. Leave a comment, let us know, and as always, please subscribe to Now This Nerd.